All right, welcome everyone. Today we're going to start our next module, which is on fungi. So let's just get right into it. The word fungus comes from the Latin word for mushroom, but fungi aren't only mushrooms. So that's just, you know, uh, probably the most obvious and the one that you think about the first are mushrooms, but fungi, not just mushrooms. Scientists have identified about 100,000 species of fungi, but this is very, very likely only a fraction of the over 1 million species that scientists actually believe to be present on Earth. We talk about edible mushrooms, and as well as non-edible mushrooms, yeast, black mold, and penicillin, which is uh, the producer of the antibiotic penicillin, are just some other examples. They are eukaryotes, by the way. That means that a typical fungal cell will have a true nucleus and it will have those membrane-bound organelles. So, let's keep going. Fungi were once thought to be plants. It makes sense, right? They grow out of the ground. Um, they kind of look like plants. They look vegetative. Um, and so, you know, before we you know, could really discover what they truly were, they were once thought to be plants. But they cannot photosynthesize. They do not have the green pigment Chlor uh, chlorophyll in order to do photosynthesis. They use complex organic compounds uh, as sources of energy and carbon. Some reproduce only asexually, while others reproduce both sexually and asexually. Most fungi produce spores that are disseminated by the wind. Like bacteria, fungi play an essential role in ecosystems, and this is very important because they are decomposers and they participate in the cycling of nutrients by breaking down organic materials into simple molecules. So without decomposers, we probably would be um, knee deep in crap, basically, you know, uh, other animal wastes or dead bodies or plant wastes, plant bodies that have died need to be broken down um, to release those organic compounds back into the environment. Um, and, the only, and the way that that's, that happens is through decomposers and bacteria. So without decomposers, uh, we would be in a lot of trouble. Fungi often interact with other organisms, forming mutually beneficial or mutualistic associations. They can also cause serious infections in plants and animals, and some of those you're going to be pretty familiar with. In humans, fungal infections are generally considered challenging to treat because, unlike bacteria, they are not going to respond well to traditional antibiotic therapy. They're, because they are eukaryotes. Um, these infections might prove deadly for individuals that have compromised immune systems. Um, one really uh, relevant example uh, is this disease, this fungal disease in bats called white nose disease. And white nose disease is basically wiping out populations of bats. Basically what happens to them is it causes them to awake, uh, awaken from their, um, from their slumber early and that uh, earlier than their food is, is ready to be eaten. And so that causes them to use up stored fat energy uh, earlier than, than normally that they would. And so they end up starving before their food uh, source is ready to be eaten. And so white nose disease uh, caused by a fungus is a really, really uh, harrowing disease for this um, species. Okay, fungi, like I said, are eukaryotes, and as such have a complex cellular organization. As eu eukaryotes, like we just said before, fungal cells contain mem a membrane-bound nucleus and organelles. They do not have chloroplasts, although the photosynthetic pigment chlorophyll is absent, many of these fungi are able to display bright colors, ranging from reds to greens to black, but they do not photosynthesize. Pigments and fungi are associated with the cell wall, and they play a, protect, uh, a protective role against UV radiation, and sudden pigments are toxic. The vegetative body of a fungus is called the phallus, and it can be unicellular or, or multicellular. Unicellular fungi are generally referred to as yeast. Uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is baker's yeast, and Candida as a species, um, which are the agents of thrush, which is a common fungal infection in the mouth. Those are examples of unicellular fungi. Some fungi are dimorphic because they can go from being unicellular to multicellular depending on the environmental conditions. 
So um, most fungi, like I said, they're multicellular organisms. They display two distinctive morphological stages, the vegetative stage and the reproductive stage. The vegetative stage is characterized by a tangle of slender thread-like structures called hyphae. The singular of that is hypha. And a mass of the hyphae is called the mycelium. It can grow on a surface in soil or decaying material in a liquid or even in or on living tissue. So here's the mycelium. And if you bundle that up, it's called the hyphae. And this is the fruiting body of the fungi. Fungi thrive in environments that are moist and slightly acidic, and they can grow with or without light. They vary in their oxygen requirements most fungi are called obligate aerobes, meaning that, like us, they require oxygen to, to survive. But other species, such as Chytromycota, uh, Chytridiomycota, uh, uh, rather, that the, they reside in the rumen of cattle, which is basically the stomach, they are obligate anaerobes, meaning that they cannot grow and reproduce in an environment with oxygen. Yeasts are intermediate. They, go, they grow best in the presence of oxygen, but can use fermentation in the absence of oxygen, kind of like our muscle cells, right? The alcohol that's produced from yeast fermentation, we learned a little bit about this, is used in wine and beer production. And the carbon dioxide they produce carbonates the beer and sparkling wines, and it also makes bread rise. So we uh, always thank yeast for the things that it produces, breads and alcohol, two of my favorite things. Fungi are heterotrophs like animals they what does that mean that means that they digest their food uh sorry heterotroph what that means is that they do not produce their own food they have to get it from an outside source and they digest their food outside of the body and then ingest the digested food they are mostly saprobes organisms that derive nutrients from decaying organic matter they obtain their nutrients from dead or decomposing organic matter and it's mainly plant material Decomposers, like I said before, are important components of the ecosystems because they're able to return the nutrients that are locked inside dead bodies to a form that is eventually usable for other organisms. Here is another pathogenic parasitic fungi, ringworm. So um, you may have potentially thought it was an animal because of the name worm, but it is a fungal infection. You get that uh, from contacting uh, sources, um, you know, surfaces that have had it on there. And if you've ever had it, you know it is actually quite difficult to get rid of. And so that is a pathogenic slash parasitic fungi ringworm. Let's talk about beneficial fungi though. Food webs, like I said, they're gonna be incomplete without the decomposers. They're able to give back the nutrients that are stuck in that dead decaying organic matter. And fungi are one of the key participants. Decomposition allows for cycling of nutrients like carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus to back into the environment. And so they become available to living things rather than just staying trapped in those dead bodies. Fungi are particularly important because they have evolved enzymes that break down cellulose and lignin, which are components of plant cell walls that few, if any, other organisms are able to digest. And that releases the, their carbon content. One of the reasons why it's so important in your diet to eat like leafy green vegetables is because that cellulose and that lignin um, is really good for uh, digestive, your digestive tract because it's very fibrous. You can't break it down and it you know, makes things move through your digestive system. But fungi are actually able to break that stuff down. Let's talk about lichens. Lichens blanket many rocks and tree bark, and you'll see them uh, in a range of colors and textures, but you probably have seen lichens that look something like this. Um, they're important pioneer organisms because they're able to colonize rock surfaces in otherwise lifeless environments, and uh, like environments that might be created by a glacial recession. So you can probably understand that it would be hard um, or difficult for a plant to grow on a rock, right? There's no soil there. It's not able to um, get any nutrients out of a, a very hard, rocky surface. But lichens are able to do that. They can leach nutrients from the rocks themselves. And that begins to break them down. And it's the first step in creating that soil that other plants would need. Lichens are not a single organism, however. It, they are rather a fungus that lives in close contact with a photosynthetic organism like an algae or a cyanobacterium. So lichens are two close living organisms, um, but we give them the name lichen. So they are a fungus and either an algae or cyanobacterium. Now it must, might make sense, right? Because 
you know, if there's really no nutrients, how are they going to get them besides seeping them out of rocks, which there aren't that many nutrients in the rocks, and that would be through the photosynthetic process of the algae or the cyanobacterium producing um, the energy from obviously getting the energy from the sun's rays and then pr producing, you know, food through that process. The excess goes to uh, the fungus that cannot do that. What are the importance to humans, though? Well, like I said, they help nutrients cycle in ecosystems. They um, are also animal pathogens, and it helps to control the populations of some damaging pests. But like I said, um, they also can uh, decimate some organisms that are very helpful to ecosystems. Um, the fungi are very specific to the insects that they attack and do not infect other animals or plants. And so there's a potential to use fungi as a microbial insecticide. Uh, and there's several species that are already on the market for this. One example is the fungus Beruvia bassania, and it's a pesticide that is currently being tested as a possible biological control for the recent spread of the emerald ash borer, and it has been released in Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, West Virginia, and Maryland. So one of the um, reasons why if you went uh, on a hike and you wouldn't be able to find many adult emerald, uh, sorry, you wouldn't be able to find many adult ash trees is because of the emerald ash borer. It decimates large adult ash trees. You'll be able to find a lot of young trees, but once they get to a certain size, the emerald ash borer um, kills it. And so using a um, a fungus that would take away the emerald ash borer but wouldn't affect any other organisms. Now I will say that we know of right now, right? This is still a, um, it's still a, a scientific experiment where we could find out that, oh, unfortunately that affects other things. Um, but so far so good. Uh, it would be a great thing to bring back the emerald ash and to, um, you know, increase the diversity of, of trees that live in, in our uh, country. So, that's one importance. Now let's talk about the uh, mycorrhizae. The mycorrhizal relationship between fungi and plant roots is essential for the productivity of a farmland. Without the fungal partner in the root systems, 80 to 90% of trees and grasses would just not survive because they could not get enough nutrients. Mycorrhizal fungal inoculants are available as soil amendments from gardening supply stores and are promoted by supporters of organic agriculture. So basically, mycorrhizae, basically what they are, are the fungus, are, are a fungus that live on the roots of plants, basically. And it helps the plant um, accrue more nutrient uh, through their roots. And this is really important because without it, like I said, um, these trees and grasses would just not be able to survive. Okay, more benefits to humans. We eat some types of fungi, right? Mushrooms figure prominently in the human diet. Um, some of us <laughs> don't like it. Some of us like them. I particularly do like them. Sometimes on pizza, they're pretty good, I think. Um, but there's also morels and then shiitake mushrooms and chanterelles and truffles. And those are actually considered to be delicacies by many people. The humble metal mushroom, which is Agarius campestris, appears in many dishes. By the way, whenever I give the scientific name, I'm not going to ask you to remember it. I just put it on there, just if you're interested. Um, so the metal mushroom appears in a lot of a lot of dishes. Molds of the genus Penicillin ripen many cheeses. And I love cheese. I bet you do too. And if you're lactose intolerant, I bet you still like cheese. Uh, they originate in the natural environment, such as the caves in France, where wheels of sheep milk cheese are stacked, and it captures the molds responsible for the blue veins and the pungent taste of the cheese. So pretty interesting. And of course, one of my favorites, fermentation. Fermentation of grains to produce beer and of fruits to produce wine is an ancient art that humans and most cultures have practiced for millennia. Wild yeasts are acquired from the environment and used to ferment sugars into carbon dioxide and ethyl alcohol under anaerobic conditions. Yeast is also used to make breads that rise. The carbon dioxide they produce is responsible for the bubbles that you'll see in the dough that become the air pockets in the baked bread. Okay, um, I'm not going to play this uh, in my video uh, because I don't want it to get taken down and you won't be able to access it. So I'm going to post this link in another uh, uh, post this video in another link on the site, and I want you to watch it because it's pretty dang crazy. Uh, you're going to see some crazy stuff, um, but um, that's that's going to be it for this lecture, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.